This is the true side of what's happened to this community. And we are all a living testament. We are here and we are going to tell this story for everyone to hear. To me, it's um, one of the darkest days for myself to the whole crisis of 1990. It was a terrible day. Nobody ever expected that to happen. Here we are, cars all busted. I'm full of blood. My daughter's full of blood. And um, I'm carrying my daughter. I don't know if what I'd do if it happened again. To one of my family. But I'm scared that I think it's gonna happen again to me. Canadian government, they have troops. Our strength comes from our spirituality. As Uguhumi people, we only have each other to help each other. That's what gives us the power. This is CKRK 103.7 FM in Godwagi. When a person asks me where I'm from, I'll say gonna walk in, they'll be like, Where is that? You know, it's like they they don't know where we are. We don't we're not recognized. If you say, oh, well, it's just outside of Montreal, they'll go, oh, OK. Yeah. Do you think it's a beautiful place here? Yeah, I, I do find it a very beautiful place in Ganawaga. I sincerely love this community. I love the people in it. I have a son who's growing up here, so my interests are for the, for the next generations. And that's who I feel is being targeted for full assimilation. And I will try my hardest to prevent that and to remain and keep our identity as a distinct people. In 1716, groups of Iroquois moved to the Seigneury of Sault Saint Louis, located on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River, facing the Lachine Rapids. They named it Carnawage. This seigneury was granted to the Jesuits specifically for the settlement of the Iroquois. The French court believed the Jesuits would gain the loyalty of the Iroquois once they were converted. The seigneury is approximately 65 square miles from La Prairie to Chateauguay. The Jesuits assumed the group of Mohawks who settled there had been totally converted to the Catholic religion. But the people had not given up their longhouse traditions they continue to be part of a clan system consisting of three clans, wolf, pathfinders, bear, keepers of medicine, turtle, wisdom. Over the years, many concessions of Sault St. Louis Seigneury lands were made by the Jesuits for the benefit of French Canadian settlers. Approximately 45 square miles of land were taken. 
The remainder of the land of the seigneury is 19 and a half square miles. In the lands we're claiming, we're not going to turn around and, and, and move anybody. Our reserve is, consists of uh, 12,532 acres. We're going to argue with the provincial government and the federal government to pay some kind of compensation for the loss of the lands. So that's 45 and a half square miles that, that we got to go dig up and say, hey, this belongs to us. From the air, you can see the results of further erosion of the Mohawk territory. Every day, about 65,000 cars cross over their reserve. Trains pass through, and the seaway traffic is on and off all day long. In 1990, the Mohawks of Kanesetake, 70 kilometers west of Montreal, by Lake of Two Mountains, made a stand to stop the destruction of a sacred area known as the Pines. Developers wanted to bulldoze it so that they could build condominiums and enlarge a golf course. We're tired of getting pushed around. What's all out there belongs to us to begin with. What gives them the right to say that's theirs? Plus, like when it all started over, it's a nine-hole golf course. Our people are buried there. This was a turning point for the Mohawk people. No more land taking. 1,000 police officers were sent to Kanisataki. This was done instead of politicians taking responsibility for land issues. In support of their brothers and sisters in Kanisataki, the Mohawks of Kahnawagi blocked the Mercy Bridge and all entrances to their reserve. The commuters who normally use the bridge would have to take long detours. Trenches, barricades, and many other obstacles were created to block access to the community. Warriors from several nations had come to give their support and their lives if necessary. My role was um, cooking and um, feeding the men that were at the blockade. I think we cooked for 100, 125 men per day, three meals a day. And um, we were getting our food from Shadigui. Just one night, I think we made 35 pots of coffee. Well, we had different uh, shifts we were on. I was there all the time, and I used to sleep on the floor. There was a lot of... Uh... Young, young people here where they needed milk and stuff like that, and, and yet these people on the other side says, no. I mean, there's a lot of secret ways that people came in and delivered other things that we needed. They were bringing it through the woods at night, hiding. There was a safe house where some of our people could go to um, be taken care of if they got caught on the outside, you know, trying to get out and get food. They were uh, keeping an eye out for patrol. They were letting um, our people know when it was safe to come. I know even some people who had, were running through the bushes to bring medical supplies and food who were beaten, attacked, uh, harassed. They had phone calls. They were calling them Indian lovers. Like towards the end, there was trucks that came in. Everybody got together to, to help feed one another. We all had to go and, you know, every morning at the Cattery Hall, and you were only allowed maybe half a loaf of bread, and maybe six eggs. It was difficult. Everybody was kind of close and pitching in and doing their share. You want to start the Indians out, but they, they couldn't do it. We survived, and we, we survived this one, too. We tried to convince the government that these people had to be fed, one way or the other. How? It was up to them to decide, was it through special trucks doing, uh, being controlled to avoid any kind of uh, arms or all kinds of things being smuggled around to support the families over there? I mean, we, we were not in war. Uh, 
I think the population felt bad about them. They were not pleased with, with these people behind the barricades. It created a larger uh, effect when the population was behind this whole issue because of the land claims. But I don't know if the white citizens understood that. We point out uh, that there are three preconditions that the government of Canada, Quebec, have acknowledged and signed. People be allowed to come and go and that food and medical supplies be allowed to come into our community. Those things have not been met. We feel that the Quebec government, the federal government, has not respected that agreement. They have not done anything to, uh, to ensure uh, that the uh, supplies enter our communities, both here and in Ghanasadagan. Après une semaine de négociation, le gouvernement a donc décidé de rompre les négociations avec les interlocuteurs en cause. Et en rompant les négociations, les préconditions qui étaient attachées à ces négociations deviennent caduques. Another precondition was not respected. By August 27, the premier of the province of Quebec, Robert Bourassa, asked the international observers to leave. The representative of the United Church of Canada and Quebec Human Rights Commission took the initiative to replace them. The police allowed the mob to prevent me from bringing that food in. We were not pleased uh, politically, we were not pleased as far as the uh, citizens of Chattagee were concerned. Here in Chattagee, we, we were the ones that were kind of hostages of the situation. It wasn't like the average person who would uh, be at the barricades uh, nightly, uh, burning the effigies and, uh, you know, uh, coming for... Uh, for, for the army to come in. Instead of taking a more calm approach and saying, look, we'll sit down and we'll try to work this situation out, the mayor very quickly uh, reacted to uh, take a radical position. Uh, some of the uh, merchants uh, called for, you know, uh, severe action to be taken. Without thinking of how, in some instances, Ganawaga had supported them to become what they were. And, and that was a betrayal. The Chateauguay commuters were enraged because the Mercier Bridge was blocked. They gathered at the police barricades in the thousands and rioted for hours, day and night. The local businesses were losing customers and millions of dollars. The population in Ghanawage is over 7,500 people and most of them did all their business in Chateauguay. All these incidents with our people, with all the riots that have gone on, the yelling and the screaming has all been incited by the bad press, by the, by the federal and provincial government and the terrible things they've said about the people of Ghanawaga and, and Ghanasadag and Mohawk people in general, terrorism and everything else. But the people of Chateauguay should realize that Mohawks and Indians of uh, Canada, United States, have been inconvenienced for hundreds of years. We are not trying to take their armored personnel carriers. We're not trying to take their country. They're trying to take our country. They've already taken all of our country. We are here, and we're going to stay here. And if you see those armored personnel carriers rolling in your direction, what are you going to do? I'll try not to get run over. Lots of rumors were flying around that the possibility of the army coming into Ganawage and people were getting very frightened. Politically, there wasn't very much that we could do because of the fact that our leaders were trying to negotiate a settlement with the Quebec government. And at the time, the army was already here, but they were on the outskirts of the community. Any place they put a man, you face him with a man. Right? right? No big deal. You don't have to sit up and stand up and be at attention all this shit. You relax. Let them stand.
Barely 20 years after the foundation of Montreal, on March 26, 1665, in reference to the Iroquois, King Louis XIV wrote a message to his intendant Jean Talon, stating, To wage war, to pursue them into their homes if necessary, in order to exterminate them completely. The following year, Rémi de Courcelles and 1,500 men invaded four of the Iroquois villages, burning everything, destroying the food, and confiscating the land in the name of the French king. The Iroquois were dispossessed of their territory in Montreal and the St. Lawrence River area, but their fighting spirit never died. Many of our forefathers and our ancestors have died for the same thing, for the same cause. We're here in protection of our people and our land. Look at us. Should we die because of a nine-hole golf course? The army was preparing to enter Kahnawake and advance on Kanisataki. The leaders made plans to evacuate the children and the elderly. They feared a shootout between the army and the people resisting a search of their homes. My sister works at the hospital and she called. She asked me if I was going to go, and I said no. She said the hospital was getting ready, and they were making sections. If there was fighting, those that would be hurt and those that would be dead. And she said, do you really want your children to see that, Yvonne? She said, if you can leave and, and not let them see it. And she more or less talked me into it. I was in contact with, uh, with, the, with, our, with our council members, and I cautioned them about declaring an emergency situation in the community. Uh, because the civil authorities lose complete control. And that leaves the door open to the province and the federal government, the army and the uh, police forces to come in. It was uh, decided that the Mercier Bridge would be the best place because there were little or no people there. One of the key parts was that our peacekeepers would lead the entourage across the bridge. Uh, they would be helped through to get uh, off the Mercier Bridge, through the Whiskey Trench and onto uh, wherever they needed to go. The older people were really worried about the, everybody else that would be left here within the community. They were really concerned that uh, the army was going to come in, there was going to be shots fired. There was, if they came back, there would probably be hardly anything left within the community itself if there was a fight. Ça, ça part de ceux qui font la vérification des quais en direction de la Chine, d'Arval, etc. Nous qui travaillons depuis, ce temps, depuis trois semaines sur, ce, sur cette affaire-là, puis que les indices permettent par de rire de nous autres, puis de traverser. Ça, ça, là, ça dépasse les bornes. C'est fini. C'est fini. Ça, ça On est prêts à... Oui, oui, oui. My husband was traveling back and forth to work. We had a boat at the time, and he'd bring back bread and milk and eggs and whatever anybody needed and he'd shop for everybody and then at night we would di distribute it you know to our neighbors or our family or whoever needed anything one morning he went to work and he went to docky's boat there was a crowd there and they start throwing uh, stones at him when the mohawks would leave the reserve they would be humiliated and every attempt was made to rob them of their dignity Anyone having a medical emergency was in for a lot of trouble 
whenever an ambulance had to cross the Mercier Bridge. I don't deal in Chattagui because of the, the, the way they treat it. My son, there was a little boy, about 12 years old, that broke his leg, and the paramedics went to the, to the hospital in Chattagui, and when they, they had to go through a police barrier in Chattagui, here comes about 15 men, they're trying to tip over the, uh, the ambulance. Now why? And my son was in the ambulance. Some hoodlums here, they was yelling, yelling, let him die, let him die. Is this human being? I was in the war six years. We respect the, the, the Red Cross all over the world. But, but people, they said ambulance is not a Red Cross. What is ambulance then? Some police were just like this. They didn't do nothing. But some turn around and they're thinking of uh, what is right and what is wrong, and they say, hey, it's an ambulance, let them go. And I started my contractions about three, three in the morning. And when she came out, I felt her rip. At the same time, she tried to pull on the placenta for it to come out, and it wouldn't come out. So they called the ambulance. The ambulance had gotten there at about maybe six o'clock. We got over the bridge to the other side, and once we got there, the, am the other ambulance was like a few ways down the road. So they got their stretcher out and they came up and they met us and they put me on in and they said that my husband wasn't allowed to come. They asked if one of the paramedics from our ambulance go over with me and they said, no, she can't go with you. We went maybe not even like a foot. And they had pulled us over. All I know was the ambulance driver had gotten out of the car, out of the ambulance, he opened the door and there was these two men standing there. They just looked at me and they said, okay, and they closed the door. And then they, we, we, we started to go again and then two minutes after it was like, we got out of the car again, we opened the gate. Oh, this man has to see. So the, the, that was three men now that have to see. We closed the door, we got ready to pull out again. It didn't happen. He got back out. He had to open the doors back. Once he had opened the door back, there was four standing there. There was three, three men and one woman. They just want to see because they think that maybe I have a firearm or something. At 9 o'clock, we got to the hospital. I think they were saying that it was one third of my blood that I had lost. The army received orders to move in on Kanesatake and Kahnawagi. Because of the army's advance, Kahnawage decided to apply their evacuation plan. I don't know, they were supposed to raid Kahnawage or something. That's when they, they, they took us some. And then because I was old, I had to go. I didn't want to go, but I had to go. We took my mother-in-law, who was 86, and um, my uncle, which lived across the street from me, who was 74, and my son, which was 10 years old, I had asked them if they would go because I was I was scared for them because we had heard that the uh, the army was coming in. It was uh, my grandson's birthday. He was going to be one years old, and uh, we got a call that uh, they were going to have a caravan to uh, to leave town. My mother was 77 and my father was 81. My daughter changed her mind. She says, "No, I can't go." So she put her baby in my car. There was between 50 and 75 vehicles that were gathered to go across. They were stopped by the SQ. At that point, they were told by the officer in charge that particular checkpoint that uh, everyone, every man, woman, and child would have to be checked. The vehicles would have to be checked before they were allowed to go through. So I asked again, what's going on? Well, they says, we have to provide you with better security in order to, to go through. When we left, he watched from the, the roof of the house with binoculars, and he knew that something was going on because the cars were stopped. They came to every vehicle. 
They searched the trunk, the underneath the seat. I mean, at one point they tried to get my father out. My father at the time was 78 and my mother was 69. I mean, he was about 90 pounds, he was sick. He was, you know, he was so weak, he could barely move his legs. And the SQ officer was, you know, pushing him in the seat. Trying, and I kept saying, we have nothing. What are you looking for, you know? And I guess they thought we had weapons or something. I really don't know. And they looked in the trunk. I asked them, what are you looking for? And they said, well, we just want to make sure, you know, that there's, you're not taking anybody out or something out or weapons out. Or I said, I don't even own a weapon. Why would I be taking anything out? I felt very bad for the elders that were among us on the bridge because some were getting sick. But what can you find when you have children and elders in a car? I was six years old. It was me, my little sister, my older sister, my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother. They stopped us on the bridge to start searching all our stuff. And that is there for like three hours. I didn't know what was going on. They just told me that we were going away for a little while. They weren't carrying firearms. They weren't carrying any of the stuff. And they, that on-the-spot check was done by our people. But unfortunately, that wasn't uh, good enough. So I let the kids out, and they would come, and they'd yell at you, get them in the car, put them back in. You're not allowed. You don't get out of your car. And then we started to argue. We said, these kids have to get out, these people. That you're, you, it was just too hot in the cars. I had my mother with me. My mother was maybe 70. It was a beautiful summer that summer. I was really upset and heartbroken for elite for having to leave. My husband gave me a paper telling me not to read this paper until I was off and out of the reserve. And it was his will. And I was crying. One SQ was very nice about it. He came and he said, look, ma'am, he said, I'm sorry. I really don't want to be here, but this is my job. And he held me and he comforted me. He asked me if I was, you know, OK. And just to be strong, keep my head up and take care of my son. When they first arrived at that point, there wasn't anybody on the other side of the bridge, meaning the north side. Uh, that one particular area was under construction was all dug up. The officer in charge of us spoke with the officer in charge of the SQ because he was concerned for the safety of the people with the people out there. And he said there wouldn't be any problem. They had uh, two bus loads. They were all full of uh, RCMP, standing by, ride equipped. On the police had orders not to arrest anyone. Their concerns were to prevent the crowd from reaching the cars and blocking their passage over the bridge. We're sitting in the car waiting, waiting. My great-grandmother was about 92 and my grandmother, I'm not sure of her age at the time. And uh, I was 18. There was hundreds of people on the other side now, calling us down, yelling at us, calling us savages, and saying stuff in English and French. Just sit. It wasn't nice. At the time, there was myself, my daughter, Sarah. She was 18 months her father and our babysitter. And we saw all the people on the other side waiting, and we also heard rumors of conversation on the French radio station to entice people to come over and to harass us in many different ways. I got out of my car and I went and talked to a peacekeeper. I said, I can't go up. I was like drained, drained. It was hot and uh, I had no more energy. So uh, then he said, get in your car there, go. And Finally, after the crowd really built up to, say, two or 3,000 people out there, all of a sudden the SQ says it's OK to go. You just can leave. Then I started to get nervous, but there was no way to turn back at this point. The delay was incredible. We were on top of the bridge at a, quite a height. 
90 degree weather. They assured us after two checks of the, every car that everything was okay. Keep your windows up and just keep going and don't stop for anything. Don't stop for anything. And I said to him, my God, there's people. You no, know, they were, you could see them on the banks. I said, what if somebody fell and run them over and just keep on going, don't stop for nothing. It was all lined with police all the way up and they were like screaming at you, go faster, go faster. And they kept waving you through and just waving. I saw a policeman standing in front of, of somebody with, with a pile of rocks and just step aside when, when, when I went through and just let them throw them. Everybody started following and stones, sticks, bricks, boulders thrown from all angles. Your right, your left, from a walkway on top. They're just throwing and throwing. A couple of rocks hit the car. I started uh, getting nervous. My grandmother was really nervous and she was driving. It was bad. And you could see the people waiting with piles of rocks. Well, they had all their ammunition ready and all oh, there was so many people. There was hundreds of people. Just a big crowd. These people started to pick up rocks and they started throwing them. And uh, one of the policemen was, you know, trying to stop them. He was like one, and all the rest of the police were way up on the, on, on the bridge part, on the abutment part. So as we went through, one big rock hit my, uh, my son's car on the back, and a couple of smaller ones uh, and broke like the back window, and it left a big dent in there. I could look in the rearview mirror, and all I could see is the dust as we, you know, as we were going through. Yes, Q. They were just standing there, they were watching. They had their backs to the people and just watching windshields being smashed, uh, you name it. There was a phone call that came into uh, the council office and said there were problems on the bridge. We didn't know the extent of those problems, uh, so we rushed and turned the TV on. just awful because you were so powerless. There was nothing you could do. I felt sick. I felt, uh, I said, no, my God, why? Why should this happen? Some people can take it for all kinds of reasons, not be able to go to work, not being able to earn a living. I have to travel all around the place to, 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 to go to work. I was really scared. Yes. Scared for my grandchildren and scared for myself. And then thank God Muna is a good driver. Because when they were throwing stones, it was just bouncing off our car. And then uh, it hit the guy behind us. So I was praying out loud, telling my grandchildren we covered the kids. And then my granddaughter's pregnant. And then she could get in, go into labor, we were afraid. I sat there during that time and thought about if I was going to tie my son in the seat next to me in a seat belt or hold him. And, and for some reason, I said, no, I'm going to hold him. I felt more comfortable putting him on my lap and holding on to him than strapping him in, which I normally would have done, but this time I didn't. All you could see was like, like an avalanche of rocks. And it wasn't small rocks, it was large rocks. Rocks like this. And you could see what was happening to the cars in front of you. So we were terrified. And my sister-in-law was crying and shaking, and a rock hit the back of my sister-in-law's window, and the window shattered. We were covered in glass. It's something that uh, I've suppressed, I think, until now. What if that baby would have got hit with the stone that they threw? I just kept praying and asking the Creator, please guide me, as I drove, and as the stones were flying, I told my mother, the children, to bend down in a car and put blankets and pillows on them. I just drove and watched the car in front of me so that I don't hit him. And every time I tried to get my, like, try to put my head up and see what was going on, 
I just kept pushing me down. I didn't know why. And just heard a bunch of yelling and a bunch of things hitting the car. Then he just went really fast and stayed down. My grandmas were all scared and everything. They were throwing stones and chairs and uh, so my daughter, I didn't think she was coming. I looked in my mirror and she was there. She was a little pale and white. Her window was all busted, her front window, her back window. So it was all dusty. The farthest you could see was a little past the windshield of your car. And all I kept praying was the person in front of me wouldn't stop to put on her brakes because I was going to hit her. And all I could hear was bang, 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 the noise of these rocks and my son crying to get the blanket off of him. And between that and my tears coming down my face, you couldn't see anything. I was just staring out the window. And it, really, I could have been hit in the face. I was there with my brother in the back seat with me, and I just decided that whoever was there, they weren't going to see me hiding. They were going to see my face staring out at them, uh, you know, a strong face. And uh, they weren't going to see me back down. 15 is uh, it's quite an age to be going through that. That was one of the things I, I knew I had to do. I felt like uh, almost like uh, I was taking care of the family in my father's place because I knew my mother was uh, very nervous. I was six and a half years old. I was holding my brother with me. He was sitting on my lap and my baby cousin was sitting right next to us in her car seat. All these people just started throwing rocks at us. I was screaming for my mom, but obviously she couldn't help because she was trying to drive us to where it was safe. My father uh, in the back moaning, he had such a uh, whisper because he was so sick, you know, and he just kept saying, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? And um, my mother was had her head down and she was praying in Mohawk, you know, Zewaneo, Zewaneo, help us, help us, which means my God, my God, help us. I couldn't believe how many people were gathered there, how many people hated us so much that they weren't there just to throw rocks to scare us. These were rocks to kill us. When I saw the rocks coming, I said, put your head down, put your head down. And my mother went down, my boys went down, and my, my older one just kept yelling, we're OK, Ma, everybody's OK, don't worry. He said, I got them covered. One was 12. 10 and 6 and I remember from the top a lawn chair coming down and I, I said I'm going to lose control. My car just swerved all over the place but somebody must have been watching over us because I didn't get in an accident. I got through it and when we got into Villa Sal, my that's when my son told me that he had gotten hit at the rock, the windows were all busted in my car. He got hit on the shoulder. They had like glass all over them, little, little cuts. He had a lot on his legs, two little cuts, but he, his, the main part was his neck and shoulder that he got hit. He knew that I had to drive and he didn't want me to panic. As we got through what they call the whiskey trench, the crowd, the mob had gathered on top of the span. The trench, which is impassable, you can't yield, you can't turn. It's referred to as the Whiskey Trench because of the Seagram's distillers on either side of the highway. It was just before I went under the tunnel that the, I heard the rock go through the window and I heard my father moan and he fell. I didn't know where it hit him and I had to keep driving and my mother was screaming and she was trying to reach over to my dad in the back seat and I was trying to reach over and try to hold the wheel. So what I did, I, I knew we were hit. I just didn't know how badly he was hit. Was he hitting the head? Was he hitting the, you know, where? I couldn't, I couldn't tell. I was looking in the rearview mirror, but I couldn't see. And I went right to the Lachine General. I pulled into the emergency exit. He had been hit in the chest, right smack in the middle of the chest. This is what they threw at my father. This is what hit him in the chest. I'm gonna keep this. And I'm gonna remember those faces. I can't believe racism is this bad in this country, in this time. I don't know what else to say. Uh. 
There was a large laceration. The skin had been broken. There was glass everywhere in his shirt, in his underwear, in his pants, socks. They were taking glass out for days after. They admitted him immediately and they started to clean him up. They cleaned up the wound, they bandaged it. He was already sick to begin with. He was already weak. He was already depressed. I couldn't believe people could be so, so cruel. I couldn't understand how how men and women could stand there and throw rocks at other women, children, and elderly people. It's hard to, to think how people could do that to you, you know? To anybody, you know? I would never think of trying to hurt anybody like that, you know? I saw a few faces, and I guess I'll never forget them. You try to forget them. You have to live. You have to put it in the past. And I always remember a little little girl and her mother standing at the corner and they were throwing us kisses. And I remember saying, my God, not everybody is against us. Over the bridge, through the, when the clearing of the, the dust and everything, I see a man, an elderly man with his two children standing there crying and waving at us and giving us thumbs up like you did it. And I remember going by the lakeshore and saying, my God, there's people rollerblading and bicycling and the, the, the life on the other side was so normal. I, and I, I kept on saying to myself, do they know what we're going through across? You know, it, it's, it's like two different worlds. You know, it was just so normal out there and peaceful. And here we were going through you know, all these things where planes were flying over us and helicopters and, you know, every day you hear somebody, you know, they're going to come in tonight, they're going to come in tonight, you know. And the police let them throw rocks and bust their windows and everything. Anybody hurt, cars. you know? As far as I know, I don't know yet. The Indians all around, they're going to, they're not going to stand for another wounded knee. And, uh, and we're going to die for our rights. All right, thank you. I remember we were heading towards the whiskey trench and seeing things being tossed and I wasn't sure what it was until our car was actually hit. I could remember grabbing a pillow that was on the side of Sarah and putting it over her and I thought that she was safe. My daughter was hit. I was hit. And um, the windows were broken on the car and we ventured through the tunnel. That was the only time I felt we were safe. And I pulled the pillow from on top of her. I looked down at her and I saw blood. And I could feel myself that I had pain, but I couldn't exactly pinpoint where it was. And I looked at my babysitter, she was screaming, you know, and I didn't know exactly what to do. I just said, let's bring her to the hospital, you know, the LaSalle General. We went running in there, and uh, they took her into emergency. They also brought me in. I had bruises. I was hit on my breast, my arm, my face. When they brought her in, it took um, an hour and a half, two hours for them to remove all the glass from her. It was stuck in her diaper, stuck in her shirt, everywhere. And to try to control <laughs> A child, you can't. I was made to feel that I, I took the decision to leave. I put us in jeopardy. Um, for me as a parent, I didn't feel I was able to do the job anymore. I hope whoever shot stuff at us is very sorry. And I'm glad that I still have my mom and dad today. Because <laughs> without my mom, I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> and I'm glad I have my family.
speaking with the RCMP that there were supposed to be a hundred other police officers st on standby right at the site to ensure that there would be safe passage. There was a lot of cops there. It was a bad scene and, and no, no riot squad showed up. We were victimized and again the violence uh, was perpetrated on us and again you know we were not the aggressors, we were not violent toward anybody. Why could they have not gone and physically stop these people from picking up rocks and throwing them. I saw the, the news uh, that evening and they were like, yeah, we got the warriors. They got a warrior. They got a 76-year-old French-Canadian from Lachine. That's who they got. Joseph Armand Lacroix. He married my mother. My mother was Mohawk. He never really recovered from the uh, incident, even when we had to bring him back for checkups. He would always be very nervous, especially going over the bridge. He never wanted to talk about it. He died in 1994. I should never have left. I would never leave again. I feel safe in Gunnawage, and I feel safe nowhere else but here. to live in this community. Gunawage to me shows how very strong and determined our people are to maintain our identity. I'm proud to be Mohawk. I think that no matter how the governments or the outside communities try, they could never beat that out of us. Not even with a rock. If I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die here. I am not gonna die from somebody throwing rocks at me. I'd rather die in my own house with my children and my family close by. The questions were was how did it happen and who planned it and what kind of planning uh, took place to allow this. And it's like we were in such a position that we really couldn't answer those questions. If the people who planned it knew what was going to happen, this would have, they would have never done that. They would have never let the people across that bridge. They would have taken them in boat or any other way. I was scared at, at many times when the women and, and the children were driving through. I seen people approaching with boulders and, and uh, softball-sized rocks, whipping them through windows and not really even caring what was on the other side of, the, of those windows in the, in the automobile. Uh, what was on those other Oh, ones? women and small children, innocent people, innocent. And that was the lowest point in my life when I seen, I would say my career as a peacekeeper and everyone else that was there that day. We had spoken to them, the elderly, telling them they're gonna be safe, don't worry about anything. Little did we know they were in more danger than we were just by passing through that one little section. That day when I came back, finished work, I just came home. I went into my bedroom and closed the door. My wife and my family knew what happened. And they didn't say a word, they just let me be. I seen it on the news that night and the hurt came back right away. Everybody was crying and I felt bad for my grandchildren and my parents. You know, to go through that. Yeah. We went to uh, a school in Dorval where they were taking names down and it was there that we saw all the damage uh, to the other cars. Uh, we were basically on our own once we went through that gauntlet. 
From there, we went, we went to uh, a hotel, stayed uh, over a week, yes. uh, maybe 10 days, because uh, we had started school. My kids cried, my older one, every day. Let's go home, let's go home. He said, I don't even care about they stone us. I heard people say, oh, you're on vacation. That was the most miserable 11 days of my life. Sitting in that hotel, you didn't know what was happening. We went out like to wash your clothes. People were staring at us, and you know you, it, and they couldn't miss you. Your car was all busted up. There was one uh, elderly man who, uh, after the incident, um, suffered a heart attack and died the day after. So that was uh, quite devastating as well. I don't know what they think of us today, but it was out of, was out of our control, and they didn't take the means or the measures to prevent something like this. And uh, I think they were well aware of it because before that, when people were, were going across, there was incidents that were happening there. Anyways, these guys, when they went to court, they, they got a smack in the hand, and that was it. 13 people were arrested. 11 adults and two juveniles. One man was sentenced to 10 consecutive weekends at Bordeaux jail. 10 of them received conditional discharges and varied fines going from $100 to $1,000 with probation of up to two years. The charges against the two juveniles were dropped. Vous, est-ce que vous avez tiré des roches? Non, madame. J'ai été accusé d'avoir carré des roches, mais ces charges-là ont été enlevées. Moi, j'ai été accusé d'avoir euh, troublé la paix, <rire> finalement. Un an plus tard. C'était dans quel sens qu'ils qu trouvaient que vous aviez trou troublé ben, la paix? C'est parce que moi, évidemment, avec une grossiole, <rire> si vous voulez, je suis allé à la caméra, ils m'ont demandé ce que je pensais. Puis je dit que si nous autres, on ne pouvait pas passer saint bar les autres, ils ne devraient pas passer ici d'autres. They blocked us from coming out or going through. So now we don't want them to come out. Okay, within some time this evening, the army's going to be going in. There are going to be women, I don't care about the children army. and elderly people. Well, that's too bad. It's not just real shame. I feel sorry for them. J'ai payé des coupables, j'ai payé une amende de 1000 dollars, j'ai payé mon avocat, puis ça a été fini. Ça n'a rien changé dans ma vie, puis ça n'a sûrement rien changé dans la vie des, des autochtones. Les, les jeunes qui ont garoché, les jeunes qui ont euh, qu on lapidé, euh, eux autres, ils n'ont jamais été en cours, ils n'ont jamais été. Euh, ça l'a fini. Là. Ça lui prenait un cabaye, je pense, puis c'est à moi. <rire> si on n'avait pas laissé passer les autos, on n'aurait pas garoché de roche. Puis pourquoi faire vouloir laisser sortir les femmes et les enfants sur la réserve? L'armée s'en allait pas pour tuer personne. C'était déjà décidé. C'était encore une faiblesse du gouvernement provincial, d'après moi, de les avoir laissés sortir. Et... As an athlete, uh, one thing is that um, I gain respect from other athletes in other countries because of the, my performance levels. Now with a full boat lake lead, nobody's going to catch the Canadians, I don't think. We have another gold medal for Canada. Yeah. Hugh Fisher and Alwyn Morris win the gold medal for Canada in the K2 1000 meters. A lot of sacrifice by both of these fine Canadian athletes. The friends that I met and, and the, the places that I've been and the respect that I was shown, I'll never forget. Winners of the gold medals, the Olympic champions, the team from Canada. I'm sharing this victory with uh, uh, the Cognawaga Reserve, with the Mohawk Indians in Canada, and with all the Native people in North America. I feel really strong about, about being an athlete, being Native, and being Canadian. And carrying it up here had a very much significance for me. And I just hope my grandfather's very proud. Thank you. Always had an easy time making friends and, and taking people for their word. And um, whether that's something that I learned as a, a young man growing up in, in Ganawage or with my grandparents, it was part of me. So when I had made all these arrangements uh, uh, with the Certea and, and uh, 
given certain assurances, I, I had to go on the word and, and my own deep feelings that this thing was going to be okay. When you relay that kind of message uh, in your own terms, in your own words, and then see what happened, you lose something. You lose that, that faith. And um, it's so difficult to bring it back in, in terms of redeveloping it. In retrospect, and that's always 2020, uh, it would have been smarter to say, look, there's a big crowd here, it's not gonna work. Go back to the community, we'll work out another way in which to do this at a later date. There was a lot of property damage. People did get hurt by the glass and the stones. Those things healed. And the fact that it happened here, in this country, suggests some very deep down problems from a social standpoint. How long is that wound going to take to heal? I don't know. Maybe not in my lifetime. Maybe the people that agreed to it, who were in command and who Alwyn spoke to, maybe were sincere and did it in good faith. But again, it was another example of the, the orders not being followed uh, by line officers. To me, it was planned. It had to be planned for them to uh, get everybody there. And all it takes is one person. Word gets around, and that's it. Everybody knows. There's nothing that's changed since that time. It's not better than it was, it's not better. Because every time there's something they don't like, it's the pont, it's the pont, it's the pont. En réalité, ce pont-là, c'est pas, pas les Octotones qui l'ont construit, c'est nous, c'est nous, les Québécois, qui l'ont construit, ce pont-là. My uh, brother worked on a bridge on the Cotelago end. It's all Mohawks, no white men. The steel arrived from the sea to the south shore end of the bridge, came by rail and it was trucked in from there. My little brother Louis had a team of horses and they plowed the road, same as they would plow on the, on the farmland, to break up the, uh, the packed snow before the trucks could get through. They had an army of men from here to shovel the snow. And uh, if your shovel was too small, they wouldn't hire you. You had to have <laughs> a regular snow shovel before you went to work. <laughs> the uh, iron workers on the Mercier Bridge itself, they were very, very tough. It was cold, windy. Uh, one whole week before Christmas, they didn't put in an hour's work. Being Christmas, the company turned around and paid them one hour each, every man. <laughs> Which wasn't very much, let me tell you. 75 cents. That was the hourly rate at the time. Those are the iron workers. We were only laborers working on the, on, on the abutments. We were only making 30 cents an hour. That was big money then. The springtime, I started work at the quarry, feeding the stone crusher. Use, they used the, uh, the crushed stone to build the roads. 10 hours a day, six days a week. That's the only time I ever worked close to home. The construction of Honoré Mercier Bridge started in 1932. They worked all year round. By July 12, 1935, the church and the state were well represented at the inauguration of the bridge. In 1955, an order in council was passed, permitting the expropriation of Mohawk land by the Seaway officials. 
This meant that the Privy Council was to allow the seizure of 1,855 acres of Mohawk land. When people refused to move, a bailiff and police officers came and evicted them. Tons of clay dug out of the canal were dumped on Kahnawagi farmland. The seaway needed to construct bridges high enough to allow the passage of large ships. The Mercier Bridge was raised and a twin bridge constructed. A lift was also added to the existing train bridge. Then, the bridges needed new highway approaches. That meant more expropriation for the Mohawk people. The other bridge was going up too, and the railway bridge at the same time. The lift bridge, all Indians worked on the uh, south shore. Five men with the pusher as the erecting. And then the uh, riveting gangs, four men to a crew. With the heaters, thick rain, and the two riveters, they changed off. You, you, you wouldn't think there were that many Indians in Kakanaga, would you? <laughs> Guy Wright, at first he wanted to call us Midget again. I almost had a fight with him. Then he changed it to a pony again. What's well, a little better than a midget game? We always had an odd man. Sometimes it was my brother Harry and my younger brother, and then one time it was my oldest brother, Howard. Well, I started over here in Montreal, about 15, 16 years old. He said, well, we used to move, move our scaffold, eh? we used to move uh, six, six by eight needle beams. They call it needle beams. It's about, oh, I say about, as, as wide as the bridge. That's how long the bridge is. Got a, hey, hey, hey. They sent a, a rope down with the planks, put it across once. So you got one plank across, then you go, you go walk under, get the other planks in, you get all set. Then the, the other again, they come on down. Then they start driving rivets. But the hardest part is more, more moving than it's high or whatever. The ugly thing was going into the city, it's like what the? Oh, yeah. Where did you say that? I had to go to the house. I'm going 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 to go I'm asking you, when are we going to go back to work? <laughs> Them days I got forever, I guess. Yeah. By 1959, the seaway was completed, and the Mohawks would forever after suffer this new interference in their lives. Kahnawagi means by the rapids. Well, the rapids are no longer in view. Much land is lost and the beachfront is gone. What do they call you, Adolf? You'll see a good demonstration of our toys. I'll fucking cut you in half. Yeah. Why don't you come and try it? This is our land. We can't go anyplace else. We can't go to another country. This is our home. We have nowhere to go. 
They have their tanks, they have their barbed wire, they have rocket launchers, they have all the armaments, you know, that you go to war with. You don't do that with native people here who have taken care of their ancestor to make sure that they don't starve. But we can't take any more of their land taking from us. I mean, this is all we have left. They have the power in their hands to change history right now. They could change it by dealing with the land issue. The armed forces mandate was to search their vehicles, I guess, for weapons. You could have left the community a dozen times during the day and you pass the same checkpoint but looked at the same people and you would have to go through the same process. If we were going to have to suffer that kind of indignity, then we in turn also would retaliate by our own plan of action, if you will, to create as much resistance as we could. It was demanded of me to open the trunk of my car, and I said, no, I said, you open it. And uh, we went back and forth for 15, 20 minutes or whatever it was, or half an hour. And I said, I'm not opening for you. You want to know what's in there? You open the damn thing, you know. Here's the keys. And, uh, and the officer wouldn't uh, refuse, you know, and we kept going. And finally, as silly as it sounds, we both held a key and we both opened the trunk. I missed at least one meeting anyway that I was supposed to be involved in uh, with, uh, with several members of, of parliament. Uh, but I did manage to get there later on in the day, but uh, it's, it's just an example of uh, how difficult it was for us to do the things that we had to do during that time period. On August 28, there were secret meetings at the Hilton Hotel in Dorval. Mohawk leaders and officials of federal and provincial governments were trying to negotiate a peaceful ending to the standoff. And I'll continue my discussions with the Confederacy. The barricades would be dismantled by both the army and the warriors. The Mercier Bridge would be open to the public and Colonel Gagnon promised the army would not enter the reserve once the bridge was opened. The barricades on the Mercier Bridge came down. The repair work was resumed on the bridge. Experts searched for explosive devices on the bridge and in the river. One day I saw just a submarine coming through and I read, I got my camera. When I took pictures, I saw it on the news and when they were interviewing and they said, no, there wasn't a submarine that came, came through. They, you know, like the, the Indians are making it up. And the helicopters, they came right over here as maybe six feet off on top of the water. These helicopters were so loud and I remember telling the kids, just like ignore it or do, you know, do your homework. In a meeting with the warriors, the Colonel Gagnon announced that his orders had changed. The army was preparing to enter the Kahnawagi Reserve. Ironically, in many battles, the Mohawks were allied to the French and English Canadians to defend Canada against the Americans. In 1847, for service in Canada, 119 medals were given to Indian warriors of which 82 were for the Chateauguay River battle. These warriors were Abenakis, Algonquins, Nipissing, and Iroquois. Although the Mohawks were robbed of their ancestral lands, they helped defend Canada against its enemies and fought throughout both world wars. Meanwhile, in Kanesataki, the army advanced and took over the pines. The warriors moved to the treatment center. Basically, I would like you to contact your uh, uh, general or whoever it is and stop the advancement of these troops until... I'm, not the I'm just saying he side. can issue the order immediately until we can resolve these things peacefully so they are not recognized in our confederacy.
The army rolled in with their armored vehicles all the way to the longhouse and raided it. Hey, so the longhouse, they raided the longhouse. Yesterday, the very attack on one of our longhouses uh, is disgusting. Uh, would you like your synagogues, your churches attacked the way ours was yesterday? Finally, the bridge was opened to the public on September 6. They were flying right over our houses, the Chinooks, the double blades, the, you know, the things are big. They're loud and they're like uh, 30 feet off your roof. Three or four of them just flying all over town. They all land on the island. We were sitting here having lunch, and uh, next thing you know, there was helicopters flying all over. Army men just flowing out of the, the helicopters. Then uh, people from town just pulled up, pulled up, pulled up. There was people all over. We were coming back from a meeting in Montreal, and. Um... I uh, received a call on my cell phone that the, uh, that the army was at the island. We should get there as quickly as we could to try and calm things down. And there was a kind of a standoff on the, on the small bridge that goes to the island between the mainland of Kahnawaga and the, the Gakuita Island. And there were barbed wire that had been strung and the armed forces were standing on the island itself and people were uh, demanding, you know, what are you doing there? At first there was no response, but then one of the commanding officers came over and said that they had received evidence that there was weapons that were hidden on the island and that they were searching the island uh, to find out whether there was any truth to this information that, that they had received. And even across the seaway, they had like uh, four or five, maybe six APCs. And even had army tanks on, like across the river with their barrels pointing right at us. What people saw was, was a row of, uh, of soldiers with automatic weapons, gas masks. They had everything to their advantage to be able to overwhelm and overpower our people. Some of them, I believe, weren't really, didn't want to really be there, you know? It's like we're stuck on an island over here and uh, all these people are around us. But they had their guns. We didn't have no guns. Are you prepared to let our people move out? No! A couple of the soldiers that were there were also in the longhouse raid and we recognized them back because they're the ones that we fought with, you know. And uh, you could tell that they were very uncomfortable standing there. They're just waiting for orders, which was, um, what, what were they going to do? They weren't going to come into town. And so they would have made it over that bridge, there would have been martial law in town. And then it would have been even worse. You're gonna have an APC parked outside my house? No way. <laughs> I have army guys walking around our territory? No way. That wouldn't have lasted. It would have been like a uh, big war, for sure. The guys that were on the force even said it. If they come in, they're gonna go with the people. Hope you guys are proud Canadians. That had to be one of the most bravest moments that I've ever seen during that time period and during my lifetime of our people defending their territory against tremendous odds. We are right. They're wrong. They're attacking us. They're proud. Look at them all. You're all proud. Then our town brought a, a dump truck to the other side of the, the bridge, blocked it. More people arrived. People were getting rowdy. They were really close to the bridge, the, the army. They made a circle. They were throwing razor wire from the helicopters. And as fast as they were throwing it, the people were picking it up. <laughs> start shooting at us. We had to A bunch of tear guys start going all over the place. People start running over the bridge to get over the bridge to get away from it. There's even women there that were pregnant. You can see that they're pregnant, but yet they still chew the guys at us. More tear gas, fights, 
after that was fighting, fighting, everybody was fighting. I myself was fighting. It wasn't planned. People were there. It was, we're just a big family. That's all. And we're going to stay that way. We're going to stay united. And we're going to be as strong as ever. Two army men just threw me right over the bridge. And there was a big rock over here at the time. Landed on that, on my hip. Fled into the water. There was people all in here, washing their face, getting the tear gas, so they could see again. Get up, go! Hurry up! Remember that teacher I had in uh, high school? He was standing there, he's telling, yelling, hold on, hold on, and I'm telling him, help me. Didn't know how to swim. I made it to the second pier, and a ship started passing. The current was pulling you in. Would have pulled me right to the boat. Would have right underneath. This is where the elderly man, Albert Stock, his father, Sonny, was holding my head above the water to keep me from going under. They lifted me out of the water and put me onto the boat. And they drove off and put me in an ambulance. And uh, finally I got to the hospital and I had a um, fractured hip in two spots. So much I wanted to get back at them. And I still remember their faces, two of them especially. Sometimes I can't even walk. I mean, it's going to be a wound that's going to be there for the rest of my life. Some had masks on, and then they would stand so long, and then another line would come in, and they would take their masks off. It was like they were always on duty. Shot us with tear gas and everything. Once the air cleared, and then we noticed they were trying to cross the bridge, and that's when we started stoning. We learned that from Whiskey Trench. We learned that from what they did to our people, going over the Versailles Bridge. OK, they want us to learn our people. That's all we got. They had their helmets and all their gear with them. And they're like, they were halfway across the bridge, but us, we didn't give up. We just kept worse, worse, throwing more stones, more stones. They couldn't take it more than they backed off. People started pushing them back away from the bridge entrance. And then they were to march over the bridge through the community itself just to show that you know, they had taken the community, so to speak. And the people's resistance prevented them from doing that. And the women are the title holders to the land. And we'll never give that up. No amount of money can take the value of our land. And all you had was people with their, with their spirit and their strength defending their territory, their village, the heart where their children are. That's what really this was all about. What kept us, gave us the strength, was our ancestors through our spirituality. And we're going to be here forever. We were always in this area. We're not going to go away. No one's going to drive us out. We're going to remain here. So the people out there should know that. It was a very tense and dangerous situation. It almost erupted into uh, what could have been, uh, I guess, a, uh, a tragic situation. Uh, one of the soldiers did get attacked and was beaten by some of our people. 
We're across from the island. There's a hospital. There's a lot of old people in there. Imagine how they how they felt. Scared, and they hear gunshots going off. To defend their, their comrade, one of the soldiers did fire one of the automatic weapons that he had into the air. And that created a situation in which then uh, the rest of his uh, colleagues then pointed their weapons at everybody. And to myself, I said, this is it, they're going to shoot. But uh, cooler heads prevailed, and they didn't. You know, they managed, they managed to, to take their, uh, their injured uh, colleague and uh, tend to his injuries. Our people were still quite insistent that they were going to leave, and they had no choice in the matter. Uh, the soldiers themselves, they were scared. Because they could see the anger and the, and the hatred uh, in our people for them being there. It also raided the, uh, the marina itself, and for whatever reason, they seized alcohol and records and all kinds of things, which from what I know and from what I understand, have never been returned. And they asked for time, they said, look, we have X number of people on the island over here, and in order for us to evacuate, we will need to make several, several trips in order to pick everybody up. And some people said, we don't care how they get out of here, let them swim if they want. We stayed there till nighttime, till they were ready to move out. We stopped them from uh, coming into our territory and we sent them right back home. Same way they came in. The confrontation lasted seven hours. The army could not enter the town as they had planned. At sundown, the helicopters airlifted the 140 soldiers off the island. The Chinook that took off almost didn't even make it off the ground. That's how overloaded they were and in a hurry to get out of here. In late afternoon, the 78-day siege came to an end. Soldiers handcuffed everyone except the children and put them in waiting buses. They were taken to an army camp. In Farnham, they remained in the buses until 4 a.m. Then, one by one, they were interrogated by the army and the police. Their lawyers argued for hours to see their clients. When they finally were allowed in the base, they were not permitted to be present at the interrogation. The warriors were released nine days later after the laying of criminal charges. Spirit was high, confidence was always high up here. There was no other, no other motive for anybody being here other than defending the, this land. And uh, when, you, when it comes to land, native people have very little left. They've either had it treated away, stolen away, or outwardly taken from them, uh, including rights, uh, just general disregard for our heritage. So nothing can shock a native because it's already been done to them repeatedly throughout history. fear of going to jail. If I go to jail, I'll go to jail with my head high. I'll come out of jail with my head 10 times higher than that. If you go to any native territory throughout North America and you ask if we're guilty, we're not guilty. And that's what counts. As long as our people feel that we're innocent, then I'll go to jail. Because while I'm in jail, I know I'll have the support of all Aboriginal people throughout North America. You all know 
what we all had went through over the years when we had to talk about this land. You know that this this um, this land we live on, this earth, is very pitiful now. A lot of hurt has been happening here, not only to us people, but to the land, to the territories. This is all our concern, all of us, different tribes on this earth. We all only have one heart. I give the Mohawk people, the Six Nations Thank of this you. territory, all the respect that I could ever give them. I can't do enough for them, but to say I thank them for opening my eyes along with other nations across Canada, Limerick. The crisis was far from being over in Kahnawage. The police continued to harass the people nonstop for the next two years. When you came back to Ganawagi, was the army still here? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They gave us a hard time when we were coming back. What happened? Uh, somewhere in uh, Highway 30. We had to show all our stuff, what we brought back, all our birth certificate. And what helped us out was my birth certificate. It's written that my father was at a war, the First World War. That's the year I was born, huh? And then uh, the provincial police, he says, okay, he says, you can go. We went maybe from here to across the seaway. There was another bunch that I had, we had to stop there. We had to report again that, you know, we were coming home. Again, we were checked below the Mercia Bridge. Again, there was another bunch. And there was about five or six cars behind us. We were all stopped. We had to get out, check what we had in there. And once we got in Ganawaga, well... I made the sign of the cross, and I thank God that I was back home. Every time you go out of town, they harass you. They pull you over, they check your trunk, they check your, underneath your seats. Even the cops, if your tire's low, they give you a ticket for that. And they search you. Your ID, your car, everything. Like two minutes later, you're going back out, they know it's you, they, just, they search you, they do it again. It was just harassment. They had, no, they had no business here after that. If you're a Mohawk, you're in trouble. The primary law enforcement agency in the territory of Ganawagi is the peacekeepers. One evening we were returning from uh, St. Costant where we had our motor vehicle repaired and Con Assistant Chief White and myself uh, had come into the first checkpoint within the reserve and we stopped by the military police and asked to step out of our vehicles, asked to put our hands over our head and we were advised we were placed under arrest for possession of an unregistered restricted weapon. Uh, we've been carrying firearms as a law enforcement agency within Ganawagi for approximately 20 years, and we've never had a problem until Monday. The peacekeepers are going to continue to function as peace officers in the community of Ganawagi. They're going to continue to patrol in the community of Ganawagi. They're going to continue to apprehend offenders in the community of Ganawagi, both Indian and non-Indian. Anybody who comes into the community who thinks they can commit a criminal infraction and get away with it, because of this possibility of charges are sorely wrong. I understand that the decision to investigate the possibility of charges was made by the provincial police. I hope the Third Sea decides to be reasonable about this because it can have a reciprocal effect. It is a very serious problem because, uh, you know, whenever they want to do something in Ganawage, they feel they can come and they don't have to consult. We have a legitimate police agreement with the federal government and provincial government that says otherwise. I think at that time we probably were the most heavily policed community you'd find anywhere in North America. We were living in Chattagee, and um, I was the president of the school committee of St. Willowbrod School. 
and they came out with the saying that we better not let the Mohawk children come back right away because it's not safe for them. And I decided to speak out, which I did. And there was a meeting of the school board. We were in the French board at the time. And I went prepared with two speeches, one in French and one in English. And uh, I didn't even get a chance to start. Um, the hatred was fierce in the room. People were attacking uh, the Gazette reporter. Uh, they threw his phone across the room. Uh, I felt very threatened and I said, let's, you know, let's get out of here. I know no hatred is evil. And I don't care if it comes out of a white man, a red man, a black man, it affects us. I kept them in French school, but I sent them to Lachine because there was just too much trouble in Shattuck and, and it was, uh, they started late. They didn't let them start at the beginning of the school year. They had a corn party the first day, but our children weren't invited. They were thinking of protecting our children. And because the English teacher asked why, she says, you have, uh, you're having a corn party, she says, and it was the Indians that gave you corn. And she says, all, your, all the, the Indian children are not in school. Un homme de Montréal, M. Prou, faut pas s'étonner de ce qui se passe aujourd'hui. Vous avez tellement tapé sur la tête des Autochtones de Kanawake. Ben bon pour vous. Eh ben, merci. Moi, euh, je suis très sceptique. Je ne crois pas à la réunification des deux communautés. Euh, eux nous demandent de tout oublier, mais eux euh, oublient pas leur passé. Alors pourquoi moi, je devrais oublier mon passé, puis eux autres continuent? Mais il reste qu'il y a eu un mort d'homme, il, il y en a qui ont perdu leur emploi. Euh, ça, ça crée beaucoup de grabuges. Et moi, je suis pas prête d'oublier. Ils disent qu'ils qu qu veulent garder leur coutume. Oui, je suis bien d'accord. Mais je ne crois pas qu'ils peuvent s'intégrer à nous comme... Euh, mais on parle si pas nous, de s'intégrer, on parle de se fréquenter quelque peu. Oui, mais je ne crois pas à ça, moi, du tout. C'est qu'il y a quelque chose en dessous de ça. Puis ça, là, je ne crois pas à leur honnêteté, malgré que je veux bien, mais j'ai beaucoup de misère avec ça. Euh... Vous n'avez pas de pardon facile, madame? Ben, j'ai pas le pardon. J'étais une qui avait monté au barricade, alors je n'ai pas le pardon facile, non. Ah oui, il y a une demoiselle qui veut vous parler. On ne dit pas de l'oublier, parce que nous autres aussi, on n'est pas capable de l'oublier. Mais on dit, il faut continuer. Il faut continuer. Il faut vivre ensemble. On n'a pas le choix. On reste dans la même place. On, on partage les mêmes terrains. On Mais va partager. Mademoiselle, pourquoi 98 et pas en 90 à ce moment-là? I went to summer drama camp and we learned how to make like a box. It's like a stage. This is my school Saint Willibrod. This is our schoolyard, and we're doing the round dance to four people. And this is me. There's a few kids in my class. Amy, um, Amanda, and Julie. They were interested in Indians, and I showed them the round dance. And there's about three Indians in our class, and we like do a few dances. And then like James and them, James, Danny, and Brock, they make fun of us because like it's different. So Heavenly Father, as this smoke rises, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit, your Great Spirit. You look upon and bless it. Purify the fire and purify this fetter that we will be using tonight as we share one another. Purify the circle to strike out I against another. I participate in a few healing circles. To strike out at you, Grandfather, Great Spirit, Jesus Christ, Gichi Manitou, and all the many I names that I went to a sweat lodge. Um, I'm just, I'm still in search, you know. But I've come a long way from where I was. That summer that many of us remember in different ways, it is good to recall it. Because like any healing, when we're wounded, and unless the wound is cleansed deeply and profoundly, the infection will continue to fester. And this circle is really... Uh really working, I think, Ron, because we've all come together and said it with the non-native brothers and sisters, and we're all working together and leaving our hurts here. My main attitude was that of indifference, making jokes about the, the warriors and about the masks and all this. And as men generally do, we like to, to kid and make jokes about things we don't understand and things over which we have no control. And it was that ignorance and that lack of control and that that was really 
controlling us. We got to meet these people and they became friends. They became brothers. We needed healing, the healing of our indifference because we started to care. I had in my classes so many children from Ganawagi. I felt after the crisis was over, I felt it was important to do something. And if I could help build bridges of reconciliation between Chadigi and Ganawagi, then that was what I wanted to do. And I enjoyed a feeling of family here in this healing circle that I had never known. We didn't open many stores in 1990, 91, 92, 93. It was the lowest uh, development mm -hmm. years in, in the province. We had a crisis then, but it's improving now. The majority of the citizens of Chattagi are pleased with what's going on between Chattagi and Kanawagi. It was a long period of time before I, I even uh, wanted to, to go back and give any of my business or uh, associate with any, any, uh, mm -hmm. anything to do with, uh, with Chattagi. So even now, it, it's a very thin layer of tolerance that's still there. And probably uh, you peel that back if, it, if there was a, any kind of a situation was to occur very quickly, that, that thing would flare back up. They say time, time heals things. Yes, it does to a certain extent, but I think the underlying uh, problems are still haven't been addressed there. Now, had not the Mohawk land been as important, then we would have not done that. As a result of it, our, our community has been economically devastated. So the first time I went back, which was to actually go and shop there, was maybe a year later. And uh, I, very, I felt very uncomfortable. I thought people were looking at me, you know. I guess we'll never forget it. It'll always be there. One time I went at Zellers. Oh, these people, I don't care, they're savage, they're savage. Hey, that's, I mean, then my daughter Mona, she says, hey, she says, we're not savages, she says. It's the people that throw stones at my mother. That's, they're the savages. So anyways, that, then they, that stopped. The, man, man, the manager, I think, came and he told them to stop. So we, we didn't even buy nothing that day. We came back out and we went home. I find people are still staring at you. Yeah, but look at this one. You always like big glasses. Let me check further down. I try, I try um, to, to remember the ones that, that helped. If we want to improve relations, we can't look back all the time. We have to look forward. We may not forget but we have the obligation to forgive on both sides. I know people uh, like to think about uh, forgive and forget, you know, and uh, let's not bring up the past. Uh, whether it's good or bad, it had a beginning somewhere. There's a cause for it. It's always necessary to look back in time what has created the situation. Why are people doing things uh, at that point? Why are there difficulties? Why is it so difficult to live in the province of Quebec, you know? And why is it, uh, why is it that much more difficult for Native people, and in this, in this instance, uh, Mohawk people, Ganawaga, to, uh, to have a relationship with, uh, with their neighbors? The land issue is something beyond my, my capacity. Or I understand the situation, but I, can resolve, I cannot resolve it. We look at the world around us, and there's not many great things to look at. You know, we see uh, disparity, wars going on, oppression, um, you know, uh, violation of human rights. You, there's a lot of negativity. It's very rewarding because you see them developing physically, you see them developing spiritually, and you see them developing mentally. 
And when you see a, a being developed like that, it's pretty hard to intimidate them, to make them walk off a, a, a good path. For our future generations, well, we've got to think of our little kids that are growing up, are coming up, and, uh, you know, to take care of whatever we have left on the reserve. The 78 days that we were home on the land, the peace that was there, just to be unified, will help us to always remember the seven generations that follows and the unborn that's coming yet. In our language, they would turn around and say, Dadi Gusodaje. Their faces are not here, they're coming though. So Mother Earth gave us life, just like a woman will get life. And each generation I knew will bring happiness and joy, and that will be the most beautiful that we can live. But we need to work together. Not just my people, but the people of the world. to go to the Canadian government and ask for our sovereignty. That we don't have to go to the Canadian government and ask for our rights to be self-determining. We have those. They're inside of our hearts. They're in our beliefs. We have to ensure that those rights continue to exist into the future so that our children do not have to go through that kind of struggle so that they will enjoy the peace and the respect and the honor of being on Wehome. So I ask you, all of you, to keep your commitment strong, to keep your prayers strong. And I ask all of you to begin to work in your communities, to begin building your nations, build your government, build your people, demonstrate that respect and honor that these people had made a commitment over 75 days. Always remember them. To have the treaties respected and recognized by the government and its citizens has always been a struggle for all Aboriginal people in Canada. The experience of treachery and loss is their history. The 1990 stand by the Mohawks of Kanawage and Kanesatake was not in vain. Negotiations on land rights and self-management have been going on with the federal government and several nations across the country. This time, the Aboriginal people must be certain that any agreement will be best, not only for the present, but also for future generations.
five pots of coffee. Well, we had different uh, shifts we were on. I was there all the time, and I used to sleep on the floor. There was a lot of uh, young young people here where they needed milk and stuff like that, and and yet these people on the other side says no. I mean, there's a lot of secret ways that people came in and delivered other things that we needed. They were bringing it through the woods at night, hiding. There was a safe house where some of our people could go to um, be taken care of if they got caught on the outside, you know, trying to get out and get food. They were uh, keeping an eye out for patrol. They were letting um, our people know when it was safe to come. I know even some people who had, were running through the bushes to bring medical supplies and food who were beaten, attacked, uh, harassed. They had phone calls. They were calling them Indian lovers. Like towards the end, there was trucks that came in. Everybody got together to, to help feed one another. We all had to go and, you know, every morning at the Cattery Hall, and you were only allowed maybe half a loaf of bread, and maybe six eggs. It was difficult. Everybody was kind of close and pitching in and doing their share. You want to start the Indians out, but they, they couldn't do it. We survived, and we, we survived this one, too. We tried to convince the government that these people had to be fed, one way or the other. How? It was up to them to decide, was it through special trucks doing, uh, being controlled to avoid any kind of uh, arms or all kinds of things being smuggled around to support the families over there. I mean, we, we were not in war. I think the population felt bad about them. They were not pleased with, with these people behind the barricades. It created a larger uh, effect when the population was behind this whole issue because of the land claims. But I don't know if the white citizens understood that. We point out uh, that there are three preconditions that the government of Canada, Quebec, have acknowledged and signed. People be allowed to come and go and that food and medical supplies be allowed to come into our community. Those things have not been met. We feel that the Quebec government, the federal government, has not respected that agreement. They have not done anything to, uh, to ensure uh, that the uh, supplies enter our communities. Both here and in Ghana Après une semaine de négociations, le gouvernement a donc décidé de rompre les négociations avec les interlocuteurs en cause. Et en rompant les négociations, les préconditions qui étaient attachées à ces négociations deviennent caduques. Another precondition was not respected. By August 27, the premier of the province of Quebec, Robert Bourassa, asked the international observers to leave. The representative of the United Church of Canada and Quebec Human Rights Commission took the initiative to replace them. The police allowed the mob to prevent me from bringing that food in. This is the true side of what's happened to this community. And we are all a living testament. We are here and we are going to tell this story for everyone to hear. To me, it's um, one of the darkest days for myself to the whole crisis of 1990. It was a terrible day. Nobody ever expected that to happen. Here we are, cars all busted. I'm full of blood. My daughter's full of blood. And um, I'm carrying my daughter. I don't know if what I'd do if it happened again. 
to one of my family. But I'm scared that I think it's gonna happen again to me. The Canadian government, they have troops. Our strength comes from our spirituality. As Ogwehome people, we only have each other to help each other. That's what gives us the power. This is CKRK 103.7 FM in Godwangi. When a person asks me where I'm from, I'll say gonna walk in, they'll be like, Where is that? You know, it's like they they don't know where we are. We don't we're not recognized. If you say, oh, well, it's just outside of Montreal, they'll go, oh, OK. Yeah. Do you think it's a beautiful place here? Yeah, I, I do find it a very beautiful place in Ganawaga. I sincerely love this community. I love the people in it. I have a son who's growing up here, so my interests are for the, for the next generations. And that's who I feel is being targeted for full assimilation. And I will try my hardest to prevent that and to remain and keep our identity as a distinct people. In 1716, groups of Iroquois moved to the Seigneury of Sault Saint Louis, located on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River, facing the Lachine Rapids. They named it Carnawage. This seigneury was granted to the Jesuits specifically for the settlement of the Iroquois. We were not pleased uh, politically. We were not pleased as far as the uh, citizens of Chattagee were concerned. Here in Chattagee, we, we were the ones that were kind of hostages of the situation. It wasn't like the average person who would uh, be at the barricades uh, nightly, uh, burning the effigies and, uh, you know, uh, coming for, uh, for, for the army to come in. Instead of taking a more calm approach and saying, look, we'll sit down and we'll try to work this situation out. The mayor very quickly uh, reacted to uh, take a radical position. Uh, some of the uh, merchants uh, called for, you know, uh, severe action to be taken. Without thinking of how, in some instances, Ganawaga had supported them to become what they were. And, and that was a betrayal. The Chateauguay commuters were enraged because the Messier Bridge was blocked. They gathered at the police barricades in the thousands and rioted for hours, day and night. The local businesses were losing customers and millions of dollars. The population in Gahnawage is over 7,500 people, and most of them did all their business in Chateauguay. These incidents with our people, with all the riots that have gone on, the yelling and the screaming has all been incited by the bad press, by the by the federal and provincial government and the terrible things they've said about the people of Ganawaga and, and Ganasadaga and Mohawk people in general, terrorism and everything else. But the people of Shadagasha realize that Mohawks and Indians of uh, Canada, United States, 
have been inconvenienced for hundreds of years. We are not trying to take their armored personnel carriers. We're not trying to take their country. They're trying to take our country. They've already taken all of our country. We are here, and we're going to stay here. And if you see those armored personnel carriers rolling in your direction, what are you going to do? I'll try not to get run over. Lots of rumors were flying around that the possibility of the army coming into Ganawage and people were getting very frightened. Politically, there wasn't very much that we could do because of the fact that our leaders were trying to negotiate a settlement with the Quebec government. And at the time, the army was already here, but they were on the outskirts of the community. Any place they put a man, you face them with a man. Right? right? And no big deal. Right. You don't have to sit up and stand up and be at attention all this shit. You relax. Let them stand. Barely 20 years after the foundation of Montreal, on March 26, 1665, in reference to the Iroquois, King Louis XIV wrote a message to his intendant Jean Talon, stating, To wage war, to pursue them into their homes if necessary, in order to exterminate them completely. The following year, Rémy de Courcel and 1,500 men invaded four of the Iroquois villages, burning everything, destroying the food, and confiscating the land in the name of the French king. The Iroquois were dispossessed of their territory in Montreal and the St. Lawrence River area, but their fighting spirit never died. Many of our forefathers and our ancestors have died for the same thing, for the same cause. We're here in protection of our people and our land. Look at us. Should we die because of a nine-hole golf course? The army was preparing to enter Kahnawake and advance on Kanisataki. The leaders made plans to evacuate the children and the elderly. They feared a shootout between the army and the people resisting a search of their homes. My sister works at the hospital and she called. She asked me if I was going to go, and I said no. She said the hospital was getting ready, and they were making sections. If there was fighting, those that would be hurt and those that would be dead. And she said, do you really want your children to see that, Yvonne? She said, if you can leave and, and not let them see it. And she more or less talked me into it. I was in contact with, uh, with, the, with, our, with our council members, and I cautioned them about declaring an emergency situation in the community. Uh, because the civil authorities lose complete control. And that leaves the door open to the province and the federal government, the army and uh, police forces to come in. It was uh, decided that the Mercier Bridge would be the best place because there were little or no people there. One of the key parts was that our peacekeepers would lead the entourage across the bridge. They would be helped through to get uh, off the Mercier Bridge, through the Whiskey Trench and onto uh, wherever they needed to go. The older people were really worried about the, everybody else that would be left here within the community. They were really concerned that uh, the army was going to come in, there was going to be shots fired. There was, if they came back, there would probably be hardly anything left within the community itself if there was a fight. Talos, I'm going to go to the Ça, ça part de ceux qui font la vérification des quais en direction de la Chine, d'Arvalt, etc. Nous qui travaillons depuis, ce temps, depuis trois semaines sur, ce, sur cette affaire-là, puis que les Indiens se permettent par de rire de nous autres, puis de traverser. Ça, ça, là, ça dépasse les bornes. C'est fini. C'est fini. Ça soit et On est prêts. Oui, 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 oui. My husband was traveling back and forth to work. We had a boat at the time, and he'd bring back bread and milk and eggs and whatever anybody needed and he'd shop for everybody and then at night we would 
distribute it, you know, to our neighbors or our family or whoever needed anything. One morning he went to work and he went to dock his boat. There was a crowd there and they start throwing uh, stones at him. When the Mohawks would leave the reserve, they would be humiliated and every attempt was made to rob them of their dignity. The French court believed the Jesuits would gain the loyalty of the Iroquois once they were converted. The Seigneury is approximately 65 square miles from La Prairie to Chateauguay. The Jesuits assumed the group of Mohawks who settled there had been totally converted to the Catholic religion. But the people had not given up their longhouse traditions. They continue to be part of a clan system consisting of three clans wolf, pathfinders, bear, keepers of medicine, turtle, wisdom. Over the years, many concessions of So Saint Louis Seigneury lands were made by the Jesuits for the benefit of French Canadian settlers. Approximately 45 square miles of land were taken. The remainder of the land of the seigneury is 19 and a half square miles. In the lands we're claiming, we're not going to turn around and, and, and move anybody. Our reserve is, consists of uh, 12,532 acres. We're going to argue with the provincial government and the federal government to pay some kind of compensation for the loss of the lands. So that's 45 and a half square miles that, that we gotta go dig up and say, hey, this belongs to us. From the air, you can see the results of further erosion of the Mohawk territory. Every day, about 65,000 cars cross over their reserve. Trains pass through, and the seaway traffic is on and off all day long. In 1990, the Mohawks of Kanesetake, 70 kilometers west of Montreal by Lake of Two Mountains, made a stand to stop the destruction of a sacred area known as the Pines. Developers wanted to bulldoze it so that they could build condominiums and enlarge a golf course. We're tired of getting pushed around. It's all out there, it belongs to us to begin with. What gives them the right to say that's theirs? Plus, like what it all started over a nine hole golf course. Our people are buried there. This was a turning point for the Mohawk people. No more land taking. 1,000 police officers were sent to Kanisataki. This was done instead of politicians taking responsibility for land issues. In support of their brothers and sisters in Kanesatagi, the Mohawks of Kahnawagi blocked the Mercy Bridge and all entrances to their reserve. The commuters who normally use the bridge would have to take long detours. Trenches, barricades, and many other obstacles were created to block access to the community. Warriors from several nations had come to give their support and their lives, if necessary. My role was um, cooking and um, feeding the men that were at the blockade. I think we cooked for 100, 125 men per day, three meals a day, 
and um, we were getting our food from Shadigi. Just one night, I think we made 34.